So I will ease in slowly. But yeah, I thought we would do something a little different tonight since it is so maybe a questionable celebration day. Um, in some ways, it's still a time of year in which there's a opportunity for reflection and connection. And I often think of, you know, especially this time of year, can be one that brings up a lot of difficult emotions for us. Some of you may have heard me teach in the past. I usually at least once a year around the holidays teach on the holiday schmear, the shame and fear that we experience sometimes in the holidays. But tonight I actually wanted us to focus more on coming into our hearts and coming into our bodies through connection. So we're going to start with just a really brief practice to settle in. And then this evening, we're actually going to try two or three different practices that help us really land in the heart and kind of feel that sense of openness in the heart. And, you know, the purpose of these practices to land in the heart is it's really difficult for us to actually cultivate tranquility and cultivate insight if we don't have a sense of being fully present in our body. We actually can't cultivate tranquility or insight, you know, calming the mind or stilling the mind or observing what's happening in the phenomena of the mind if we are really overactive in our head, which I know a lot of us experience. And last week, it was really wonderful. You know, um, a couple of people were so honest about how hard it is to meditate, how hard it is to have those racing thoughts. And, um, you know, part of the practice of returning, of course, like that, that is essential, right? We have to return and return, but it can feel, yeah, a bit discouraging at times, you know, like, oh man, all of these thoughts I have to return from over and over and over and so sometimes these practices where we focus more on settling into the heart, we don't have to effort at being present. We just feel more present and available. Um, so yeah, so I have a little something cooked up for us and something new for me to offer here. So we, we are going to um, kind of spend some time together in the end with a chant of Omane Padmehum, and I will describe what that is and what the words mean and why it might be useful. Totally optional. I do not have like an amazing singing voice. That is not a requirement. Um, but there is something quite special, special about bringing mind, heart, and body together with voice um, and really landing through that. So we're going to kind of work our way up there. We won't start there. So tonight, let's just give ourselves a moment um, to arrive here more fully. So we'll just do maybe five or so minutes of practice, just arriving in the body. Notice what happens immediately when you just first close your eyes and bring attention inward. And allow yourself to fully inhabit the body. Just a sense of your awareness and attention saturating the body. Taking a couple moments to feel the body from within the body by noticing the back of the body from the buttocks to the back and the shoulders, back of the neck and the head. Noticing the front of the body, the face, the chest, the belly. Noticing the arms, the legs, the bottom of the feet. And then noticing this entire tactile field of sensation that is the body, 
incredible sensor sensorial experience of being in a body. See if you can soften the eyes. Soften through the chest and the heart. Soften in the sense of letting go through the belly. And if it's possible, see if you can bring all of your attention and awareness in the belly as though that were the seat of all experience. In the belly and bringing our attention and awareness here can feel like a profound refuge in this very stable, solid place in the body, low center of gravity. And really notice the subtlety of breath as it rises and falls at the belly. And consider the possibility that this could be the only thing that mattered following the breath, noticing the sensations at the belly, that everything else could just wait. Give yourself fully to this following of the breath with attention and awareness. Thoughts, memories, and images arise, of course. See if you can feel a sense of greater ease. And then release whatever has captured the attention. And find this sacred opportunity to return. Returning again and again. Just a couple more moments here, almost feeling as though our practice is like a blanket we wrap around ourselves. Just providing this refuge, this warmth.
taking a moment here and considering our purpose for coming tonight. Finding within it that seed of altruistic motivation, that sense of knowing that being here allows us to be more present, available, compassionate everywhere. To finish off just this initial settling in practice, we'll do three longer inhales in which we exhale with the mouth open, almost like a sigh. So inhaling in together. Exhale, release. And again, inhaling. And release. One more time, inhaling and release. Gently wiggling fingers and toes, blinking eyes open to our shared space. Welcome again. Hopefully just a little bit more present. So what I would love for us to kind of not extend too far out of our experience in our bodies. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk about first is, is gratitude. And so interesting, gratitude is, is not a practice that you'll find in old path white clouds. <clears throat> it's, not a, it's not a traditional Dharma practice per se, but there's something so kind of infused with the kind of philosophical view of gratitude. Whenever we look closely, whenever we really see the true nature of things, gratitude just naturally arises. Some folks might know uh, the, the author Robin Wall Kimmerer, a really beautiful writer, throat braiding sweetgrass, and I think even a new book. <clears throat> and she really brings indigenous wisdom with kind of biological plant science. And she talks about gratitude as a, a process that allows a reciprocity with the world around us. That when we can appreciate what we are receiving, it in kind makes us want to offer. So there's this real beautiful kind of virtuous cycle. And that observation of her is this, if you give thanks, right? And in some or many indigenous cultures that, that I've learned um, even just a little bit about, giving thanks is huge, right? Giving thanks when you go to the hunt, giving thanks for um, the coming of a new season, giving thanks so much of that kind of recognition that we are here because of others. There's that real infusion of the interdependence, again, that we see threaded throughout um, Buddhist practice. And gratitude as its contemporary positive psychology manifestation, which I teach a lot, it really helps people. You actually don't need a, a large spiritual um, orientation or background for the simple practice of gratitude to start to kind of shift and change not only your momentary state, like feeling better, but actually how you act in the world. There has been amazing research that shows that people who are reflecting on their gratitude are more likely to be kind to others behaviorally, not just, oh, I'm practicing gratitude because this feels good which is a little bit of my critique in positive psychology. Often it's kind of using these techniques so that your little world can be okay. And like forgetting that there is no your little world, right? That's just a fantasy. We have to be including others. And what I notice about the practice of gratitude is it has a real unique qualitative experience in the body. 
like when we think of something we're grateful for. And in order to practice gratitude, I think in a in the most effective way, we're really thinking of what we feel thankful for and a sense of, of reverence to what we've been given, not thankful in a transactional exchange way, but grateful in this way of recognizing that without this, that, or the other, um, like I wouldn't even be here, right? A sense of, we can have the gratitude, of course, for our ancestors, but the gratitude of our daily life experience too, which has a bit more of the flavor of appreciation for all the intention and effort and the recognition of how that impacts our life. So it could be really simple. Like I think um, I feel extremely grateful for the ocean. Just unbelievable place of joy and um, connection for me and for many. And to feel gratitude for the ocean, it's not just, oh, I, I, like, I like being in the water, it feels good. But really tracing to, you know, wow, I'm so grateful for all, like for Surf Rider Foundation, for all of the organizations that are trying to protect and sustain our clean ocean so we can be inside of them. And also a recognition of what it does for me to be in the ocean. Like it truly is a place of healing. It's not just, oh, it's nice. Like how does it shift and change me? So our gratitude can really contain both of these aspects, like a real specific understanding of what has made this possible and what is the impact on me? So for us to really feel that and resonate it, it does help to give words to it. So I would love to hear from as many people as possible. And my invitation for us is to use a kind of um, more contemplative speech. So not just kind of telling a story with excitement, but really noticing how does it feel in your body? when you're sharing about gratitude. And then when you're listening to others share about gratitude, what do you notice in your body? So we're really going for understanding the kind of dimensional aspect, the felt aspect of this practice. So anybody want to start us off with a, a gratitude online or uh, here? Great, thanks, yeah. <laughs> oh. Somebody there? Oh, we'll, go, we'll go one in the room first and then online. Thank you, sorry, I didn't see you. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, I just recently got back from Canada from visiting my daughter who lives there and I'm really grateful to see her and her partner, but I was also immensely grateful to see uh, maple trees. Hmm. Um, they're these amazing, they're all over Vancouver, and they were in the middle of bright red and orange, and they're so beautiful. And I felt such a connection. Not only there's, you know, beauty, but there's maple syrup, and there's also like, <laughs> this is the on the Canadian flag, and I just felt like so... I, it just felt like such a sense of, I just felt honored to be in a country that has a maple mm. leaf on its flag. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you so much. And do you remember, if I can ask the follow-up, like what does the gratitude or appreciation, I like appreciation, it's a beautiful word and, and honoring. What does it feel like in the body? Uh, it feels like, like my heart sings mm -hmm. basically that there's a resonance i feel a resonance with the natural world and almost like that my blood is pulsing and the tree is pulsing so just mm, yeah it's like a, uh echoing or mirroring mm. yeah which is just beautiful thank you so much yeah thanks yeah all right online please yeah so um i just wanted to offer that when i really lean into gratitude it's usually around um nature and i work with the trees and nature is just so generous and especially just even the trees but it's easy for me to just slip 
into like wonder, uh, awe, um, a feeling of really being held by sort of everything. And mm -hmm. then just more gratitude. <laughs> and it kind of just goes in a cycle like that. So, Yeah. And can I ask, um, one of the instructions that I really appreciate in, in gratitude practices is really specific, like one time, you know, so is there like a specific tree or a specific moment you can recall recently? I know it's hard to choose one, but... Um, well, um, you know, that is hard to choose a specific tree. I do bonsai for a living and I really like lean into, um, um, the different, the variety of species. Um, but I find myself a lot of times, um, just, um, enjoying a, a simple piece of fruit mm -hmm. and, and um, just really having like fruit samadhi just um, and about and around ge the generosity of nature and the gratitude of everything being provided for us yeah. in yes. that way. So. Beautiful. Thank you. That's so cool that that's your job. <laughs> that's uh yeah such a contemplative practice um and i and i do think you know you describe very well what robin wall Kimmerer is trying to capture is just that when we feel ourselves part of this cycle right that we are receiving this generosity we really it's it's not like a responsibility like i should care for the natural world it's it's a desire right we it's easy to care for what makes us feel good um, that we feel kind of connected to or related to. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really interesting kind of piece of some of the work in how do we manage the ecological distress of our time? You know, there's so much to be distressed about. We could hang out and worry. Doesn't really help. <laughs> that sense of gratitude and really bringing in an appreciation for what is there. Um, I do think it's a very good way to be with kind of, you know, often when we're experiencing loss, we're recognizing the measure of our love, right? And so how do we bring that in our gratitude and appreciation with the natural world? So thank you. Anybody else? I have a couple things. Um, one I really like in braiding sweet grass when she says that um, I, f I think I forget what tribe she's from, but I think it's upper upstate New York. And yeah. That the word for plants are the, are the ones who take care of us hmm. in their language. And I always thought that was really beautiful. And it reminded me, uh, I take care of the garden out back and um, I was really grateful for the rain um, just recently because it, everything was like so well watered and it looked so clean out there and like took all the dust away. Mm. So I was really happy and grateful for the rain. And, um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bad at how things feel in my body, but, um, it, it, I just felt sort of a, a buoyancy, mm. I guess. Perfect. Um, is that a, that yeah. makes sense. Um, and a happiness yeah. uh, for that. And I also do, um, occasionally, and I've done it for a lot of years, I've done gratefulness with my son, mm. uh, before bed. And it, it's really sweet to watch him. Uh, and I, and I try to make him be specific and he's, he's gotten pretty good at it and he can just, mm. uh, kind of roll it off now. And, um, they're always, you know, funny kid things. And, and I guess I'm really grateful that that gratefulness practice has happened. And yeah. so it, there is sort of a cyclical, uh, a benefit that, um, you know, brings joy to me to see him be in that place and sort of give thanks. And, um, that comes back to me too. So. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I do think, you know, the, again, kind of as an antidote to fear, right. Appreciation and gratitude is we can be worrying about what we don't have or what's not available to us. And then just that 
appreciating what is here and doing so again, kind of like seeing it very clearly. It is so easy to forget um, and not see. Yeah. Anyone else online there <clears throat> want to share? Yes, Diane. Hi. Uh oh, you're muted. Oh, okay. You know, I don't know where to begin because I have <laughs> a lot of gratitude. <laughs> my license plate is Oh My Grateful. <laughs> OMG 8 FL. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I want to uh I want to share two very different things completely at the different ends of the spectrum. The, the first one is um my uh my my building, my apartment got broken into on Monday. Oh, I'm so sorry. It sucked. But I had so many moments of gratitude throughout the day. And I just want to highlight one, which was I came downstairs and saw the door had been smashed open. And I was like, okay, I got to do a bunch of stuff. And it, the, the whole body just kind of lit up with stress and gut and muscle tension in the jaw. And I did a bunch of you know, my neighbor came down. There was like an hour of like mulling around and trying to see if we could fix it. We couldn't, so doors open. Anyway, but every morning I walk over to Ritual and get a cup of coffee and I um, make small talk with the baristas and I, I like them a lot. And I walked over there and I was just in such a state and was check in on with each other and it's like how are you doing and she was like how are you doing and i was like i got broken into and i and we're just going through the motions i all have this and i hand over my credit card and she's like i got you and i was just like oh <laughs> it was just this one it was the moment where uh and there would be more moments that day but it was like the first moment where i was just like oh hmm. and i could just feel just this, uh, just a ratcheting down. And there were lots of ratchets up later that day, but that was such a specific moment of mm. like, okay, the, the universe has got me. Right. And then speaking of the universe, last Monday I went to a talk at the Cal Academy of Sciences about where the uh, molecules in our body come from, where they took three specific things, oxygen, uh, gold and potassium and just trace them back to where they first came from. And long story short, um, <laughs> the longest story, but like the only reason we can move our muscles is because potassium is created when two neutron stars, which are the incredibly dense aftermaths of supernova that didn't quite turn into a black hole. When there's two of them, they're close enough that they go into orbit around each other. And after millions of years circling the drain, smash so hard into each other that they create heavy metals like gold and potassium, which get flung across the universe for billions of years. Wow. And none of us would be possible if that weren't the case, which is crazy. And at the end, the, at the end of the talk, the, the professor showed uh, a simulation where they started with like today, the solar system, and they just played it backwards following a hundred oxygen atoms, just getting splayed out across the universe where they first came from. And just like the chills, <laughs> you know? So hmm. anyway, I felt a lot of gratitude for being alive after that one. Hmm. It's like, uh, it was like simultaneous origination, but like, <laughs> computationally yes yes so both of those things happened in the last week and mm. it was i just have been thinking a lot about both of them yeah thank you yeah it's been a crazy week i was like i'm so sorry it's so horrible a lot 
Yeah, and I, and I think um, you're preparing us, uh, spoiler alert, we are going to work with awe also, but staying in the realm of gratitude, and what you're describing gets more on the awe, right, like that. Um, but staying with gratitude, I, I find it to be a bit more like down on the ground, you know, but I love the description of feeling held. And again, what allows us to do our practice, right? To be able to settle the mind, heart, and body so that we can do the important work of training our attention and awareness so we can catch ourselves when we get caught in negative ruminations or frustrations, like that's what we're here for. And in order to do that, we kind of have to have that feeling like the universe has got me or like someone has me, right? There's actually a dropping in and down in the body and no one can force that. You can't just be like, I'm here to meditate in the body, right? Like you can't. So it's like, how do you approximate that sense of, of appreciation to the extent that you feel held? Like it feels okay to be here. So does everybody in, as we're talking, does everybody have like a, a feeling or experience of gratitude that they can relate to or bring to mind? Yeah, friends online too? Okay. We do have a raised hand. Oh, great. Leandra, um, can you unmute please? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. This last, like I think maybe two weeks ago, um, we found a cat in the street um, that we took in, and uh, we've been wanting a cat for a little while. Like, I got one. So, you know, that kind of feeling the last person brought up about the universe just kind of like has got you is is cool and then um just like i don't know the gratitude i feel towards our cat is like this like it's this it creates like this very like warm and like feeling in my body and to have like the opportunity to like have another like, connection I think another mm. uh, especially just like you know like it's not a human it's a little like mammal and like so it's like this this um you know learning to like communicate and like live with and like love like a cat is really nice. <laughs> I'm a huge cat person. I can really relate to that love. And yeah, it's interesting too, you know, you kind of realize that this like offering of love can be something you're grateful for, right? So that gratitude to be able to kind of safely care. And I do think our animal friends, it's such a safe and beautiful love, right? It's so um, kind of pure in this way. It's not a, a lot of ill will or confusion or insecurity or control issues, right? That's just this, um, this presence of love. And interesting also to think about like the generosity of allowing ourselves to be loved by another. A lot of myself among them, very self-sufficient people can be difficult to offer, right? To offer ourselves that, yeah, actually I need some help. And what an amazing feeling it can be to offer help to someone and yeah, it's just the generosity, the gratitude, the kindness, they really create this beautiful cycle that's so natural. Um, and, you know, thinking of how all of the, in the time of the Buddha and, and up until today, many monastics live entirely on generosity, right, dana. And they're just, their entire life is on the generosity of others. 
create such a beautiful dependency, right? So they are allowing themselves to be completely vulnerable with this aspiration and hope that others will be generous and that they can then feel gratitude and that their gratitude is the gift back, right? Because supporting a monastic who's in their prayers and who's in their practice, it's considered to be of great merit or great benefit. So, yeah. So what I'd love for us to do is uh, take a moment and sit with gratitude. So we'll just do that again for five minutes or so and just notice, explore, like feel, is there something different in the body that we can experience when we bring forth gratitude. So again, just noticing the, the difference or the shift as we turn our attention and awareness to the body. Again, bring to mind this experience we feel grateful for. Whether it's the beauty of a tree or appreciation of the rain, kindness of another human. For a couple moments, almost as though you were replaying a movie, really see, bring to the very front of the mind this experience of gratitude. And then release the image or memory. And very gently and very simply return to breathing in the body, but breathing in the body of gratitude. Feel or imagine that sense of being held, cared for, supported. Just so simply be with that. Breathing in, feeling support, breathing out, feeling support. And whenever the mind wanders away to something that isn't feeling support, just again, relax, release, and return. The feeling starts to get too diffuse and can bring forth the memory again for a moment. Kind of let it lighten up in mind and heart and body and then release again, keep coasting, feeling the body, feeling the breath and just being simple with the body and the breath.
doesn't matter how many times you have to come back. Just keep coming back. Again, this simple experience of breathing and being with the body in which there might feel that presence or resonance of gratitude, appreciation. And then we'll bring the practice alive in this moment. And considering just this breathing body, what is there to be grateful for in this moment? It doesn't have to be the right thing or the perfect thing, just allowing the mind and heart and body to connect with gratitude in this moment, in this breath. And again, release the object of gratitude. And for just a couple more moments, let's continue breathing, aware of gratitude in the body. Through inhale and exhale. Thank you for your practice. Be curious from folks, anything you notice with kind of bringing gratitude into the practice? Does that change at all? Quality of the body or mind, anything you notice? No, someone else wants to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Rap. 
Um, it's real quick. Uh, one thing I noticed about this practice is that it, it feels a lot like loving kindness mm. or like a compassion practice almost in, in my body a little bit. Where yes. Warm light yeah at the heart yeah or tonglen or something that, that's yep. what it reminded me of yeah and um is it is it because i think sometimes it's so interesting like the warmth at our heart can sometimes make us a little fuzzy did it still feel kind of bright at all i know it's a hard question oh uh, yeah I, no, it was bright it was, yeah it was kind of bright but it wasn't a dull fuzz I yeah. mean, there was maybe something gooey or fuzzy or something i i you know maybe fuzzy is a better word for it yeah um, no the uh, vividness or something you know, yeah is still good pretty alert and bright yeah thank you um it's really easy to be present um uh i i felt just really comfortable and in, in my body and mm -hmm. grounded, which I didn't feel at the beginning of tonight. A lot of turmoil, mm -hmm. but um, but gratitude is I have a lot of it, you know, and for a lot of things in my life, including this room and all of you, you know, and um, and that. It's, it's easy to feel. It's an easy thing to to tune into mm. that's very solid and grounding. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. For me, it feels like very linked to dissolving the self. So it feels like a lightness of me, mm. but yeah, kind of like dissolving, kind of like letting go of solid solidified stuff mm. like way more than loving kindness i don't know why mm. I feel like loving kindness still kind of keeps the self more solid mm -hmm. but gratitude is definitely a longer direction of it being dissolved i don't know yeah it's so interesting um i'm writing a little paper right now on ego dissolution so um because you know fun things you do when you have time off um but there's something about gratitude that really is a recognition that others make it possible, right? So the, there's a little less of that. I wish you to be happy and know the causes of happiness. So I wonder why, I wonder if that's part of it, right? Of It's really that recognition of um, receiving as opposed to extending. Um, <laughs> But not just, yeah, it's, it's it's a very powerful antidote to so many ills in our society, like not only the anxiety and fear, but also greed, right? And needing more, craving, desire, right? It's, it's so tempting, just like more, like I just want what I just want more. And, and that kind of sated feeling, right? Like Ron, you're describing it, like I'm just, I'm, I'm here with this. So thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I had another question. Like, kind of related. So, it's, it feels a bit different. Like, being grateful about somebody else, like a being, for example, being grateful for your teachers, and being grateful in kind of without being targeted to a specific being. So I don't like also from indigenous people being grateful for the opportunity to be here and work for the benefit of all sentient beings. So kind of like a gratitude, not targeted to a specific yeah. being. I don't know. Can you talk a bit about this? Like this yeah. is slightly different. And I don't know one yeah. is harder than the other. Or something. My guess is that's a really good question is that it's like um, kind of relative and absolute. I, or, or personal and then universal, like often these oscillations that we're making in our practice and in our intentions. And I think it can sometimes be um, helpful to have the specific, maybe a person, and then 
bust it open to all beings, right? And and have that be uh, bigger. And I do think, you know, just interpersonally, the world we live in, the people we live with, <laughs> gratitude really helps, right? Really, oh my gosh. There's, you know, many of you know the Gottmans who are this married couple, researchers and therapists, and they study uh, a lot of what allows couples at an emotional level to, to thrive. And gratitude <laughs> is definitely in there. Um, it's, it's like almost, I mean, it can, if it's prescriptive, it can start to feel really icky, like, all right, here's my grateful thing for you today. Right. Like that. No. Right. But it naturally arises like all of these radiances, all of these qualities of our heart that are so kind and benevolent. It's not like we have to force them. It's just, we have to pay attention and, and like allow them. And when we start to notice kind of have like gratitude awareness, like right it's everywhere all the time so i think that is um and i think the the personal and the universal is an interesting one to play with because again with the you know the bonsai is it like one bonsai tree or is it that all the trees are so amazing right and what's the difference i think this specificity again this is um imposed more by the research studies so how do we get the most kind of benefit psychologically from people with gratitude is when it's specific meaning we're really specific about what it is we feel and like what the benefit is for us like why you know not just oh, I really like being outside. I'm like, well, what about it? It's like, I feel like my blood is like the blood of the tree. It's like, wow, right? That's such a bigger, richer sense. And I don't think it needs to be specific to one being. But yeah, it's great to think about. And um, I want to, I often love weaving in gratitude and awe together because awe has been also in the positive psychology world. Actually, I, I really have appreciated the research on it. One of my dear mentors, um, Dacher Keltner, has studied this work for a long time. And just this attention to this emotion brings forth the recognition that there is more than just kind of feeling good and not feeling bad. Like there's something bigger because awe, it feels good, but also there's like a little terror inside of awe. There can be, right? I'm like, whoa. And the specific definition is this idea that something so great or so vast that it requires us to, like the word they use is accommodate. Like our, our mind, our under, we have to accommodate this vastness. It's like, it shifts how we see. It's so big. It's so great. And often that shift is like what you were describing. Like, oh my God, these things bumped together thousands of years ago so I can move my hand. Like just that, like, wow. And that feeling of real smallness and recognition of the bigness or the vastness in which we live within. And, it, and for those of you who've ever had that in practice, I think Tom, you described this the other day, the referencelessness. Like if I'm not who I am, like if I start pulling away the layers of my identity, like where does my mind go? Like there's nowhere to hold on to. Referencelessness. And yet that can be a, a feeling also we get in awe and in both cases, it can be sublime and it can really show us this kind of boundless quality of our awareness, right? It's not just one thought to the next thought, but wow, there's something so much greater. So I think awe can feel to people like overwhelming or there can be that, wow, like, wow. And it's definitely helpful to have, you know, a big wide vista, right? Like big, you know, um, being on the top of a mountain or being at the foot of the ocean and seeing, but we can actually find awe kind of anywhere. We actually can, uh, you know, I've, I've, in, I've encouraged people to look for awe in their fingerprint, such a small area, but when you really start to take in like these tiny little swirls and that we all have these different, Wow, just this body. I mean, right? It gets it gets there really quickly, and 
you know, one of the things um, I find really interesting is, is awe is definitely something in the research um, on psychedelics that's considered to be a huge factor in positive change. We don't look at it as much in meditation. It's like psychedelics has kind of got ahead of the game in psychological research for bringing back the spiritual to research. And awe to me has a real sense of spiritual, right? And I do think in contemplative and meditation practices, we can experience awe, like that sense of reference, referencelessness. God, that's hard to say. Referencelessness, that spacious expansiveness of our own mind. It's often described in the traditions as bliss. But there's an awe. You know, it's just the vastness, the bliss of just nowhere to land, nowhere to go. So really, really beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think gratitude and awe are both kind of gateways towards devotion. Very complicated word. Such an important part. I mean, as a Vajrayana practitioner, devotion, without devotion, your practice goes nowhere. And that's not because you have to revere someone or put someone above you, but it's actually that you have to bow low and recognize like with humility, the greatness of the potential of who you can become. And the reason you feel that towards your teacher is they show you, not me, you guys. I'm just, <laughs> I'm one chapter ahead. That's all. I've read the, read the notes. But just that idea of we can have a devotion towards the teacher because they represent the teachings and the teachings represent our awake nature. So it's not a devotion to like this thing up there. It's to us and not in a self-centered way, but like just in this, wow, I am. And because the devoted, it brings forth our yearning our yearning to be free. It can't be a desire to be free, not strong enough. It can't be like, I should be free. But like that deep yearning, like, I want to be free. And that sense that it it's possible to be more free. You know, that is just such a beautiful feeling and such a beautiful opportunity to feel in the heart. And I kind of like, I kind of, again, I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I teach, as some of you know, in, in often very secular settings. And, and I always try to teach in a way that you don't need belief. But there's a limit to what you can teach if you can't help people find devotion. Like, how do we help people find that sense of, again, a, a reverence and awe, so gratitude and an awe that makes you feel the real commitment that pushes you on the path, really pushes you on the path. And it's really interesting because when we start to feel devotion, it is like a giving up that it is something we need to figure out on our own. It's like this devotion to the greater. And we can do that in a whole variety of ways. I bet people in here practice bhakti yoga. Does anybody practice bhakti? Well, no one in this room, but I'm sure uh, some folks, maybe people online, This that's a practice where you are dedicating all of your practice of yoga kind of in that reverence, right? And often includes chanting and otherwise. And then there is kind of spiritual song as a way to invoke that sense of devotion. I think mentally or cognitively for most of us, devotion is it's a tough one. It's a real tough one. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what folks think about that word or about that concept. I know it's tricky or maybe a natural sense. Yeah, Jimmy. Well, for me, the, the practice of devotion and the, the ability 
or the, the, the practice of devotion occurs in a, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat linear way with starting with gratitude and then sometimes having the experience of awe because of something I see mm -hmm. or having, or I can have the experience of awe just sitting where I'm sitting, wherever it is, and just blown away at the fact that I'm still alive. Mm. I'm, I'm healthy. And I'm, I'm, when we were sitting here doing the gratitude practice, there was a lot of things I was grateful for. And then I just had this really strong feeling of being grateful for this mm. for sitting here with this group of people doing this practice yeah and that gave me a sense of awe mm. I mean, a memory of a sense of awe but the, what happens for me is I can have this like mind-blowing awe kind of experience and it gets really exciting and it's really bright and my heart can start to pound and my breath can get, you know, uneven. Mm. And then I'm like, I sort of get to the point where I'm almost worn out by it mm. and depleted by it. Yeah. But there's still this sense of awe, this memory of awe, which leads to this, this, um, this wish for devotion mm -hmm. to that experience. Yeah. And it's just this, it's, it, and at that point, it's like, okay, what's next? And it's sort of like beyond thank you. Yeah. It's beyond this is really, really great. And then, and there are a few devotional practices that I've encountered over the years that come in at that point after being grateful being blown away with awe and then just like okay now it's time for devotion yeah that's where the sense of devotion comes in hmm. um and i don't have a weird problem with it anymore because i know i'm not, it's not it's it's not being devoted to something outside of my experience yeah. Something apart from me. Yeah. It's being devoted to that. Or having a sense of devotion to that that interconnected everything at once with me included in that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's really Maybe some of you are familiar with devotional poetry, like Hafiz, right? And um, really beautiful, like that yearning. One of the only poems I know by heart, but uh, don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it season and ferment you as so few human or divine ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight makes my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need for God so absolutely clear. Just like a devotion, right, to something so much bigger um, and such a reverence. And it is, yeah, it's again kind of funny, but I, st I was like wanting to bring devotion tonight so that we can be in our bodies, actually. Uh, we can have a sense of like really fully inhabiting our practice. I think when we're trying to think our way through it or effort our way through it, we just get all rigid and tight. Uh, so it can be very helpful. Any other questions or thoughts, objections? We'll just like, yeah, quickly aside, devotion goes wrong when it's to someone who is above you and taking advantage of you. And it has gone wrong a lot. And it's such a bummer because it, it really 
can sour what is such a beautiful practice. Um, and I love, I think in the Dharma Collective, we really do have more of a kind of Kalyana Mitra, Buddha the future is the Sangha approach here. And so devotion really can be for ourselves waking up and for each other in support of waking up. Right. And that's that I think is a very wholesome uh, devotion. Any questions, reflections? I just really appreciate you adding that last part because I do feel that devotion has been spoiled for me in a number of ways. For yeah. The kind of a, and now it sort of feels like, oh, it's so naive. And, yeah. you know, and then you sort of move to cynicism and skepticism and, you know, oh, yeah, what are they? You know, there's this, so I really appreciate you piecing apart that sort of a particular kind of devotion that yeah. can into something equitative as opposed to yes which i'm just really oh really yeah okay. yeah <laughs> yeah and it is you know it's interesting um both gratitude and awe which have been extensively studied especially gratitude um you haven't really seen a lot of studies on devotion fortunately um but on those two humility naturally arises it's not even the purpose per se of those practices, but a humility. And I've always heard from the teachers I respect most that the sign of progress on your path is humility. You know, so the sense of like, what can allow you to feel and, and humility doesn't have to be kind of like self-effacing, but just really being simple and clear, right? With you know, the magnitude of suffering in our world, the difficulties that we all face. And I think humility comes also with that natural, boundless compassion, really recognizing that every single being is just like us, just like us, no matter how messed up their manifestation is, right? They want to be happy and free from suffering. That's such a humility to really hold that as like our ongoing worldview. It's a very powerful practice. Um, so I do want to talk. Well, of course, yeah. Vajrayana. Yeah. Yeah. In in Tibetan Buddhism, so there's many different schools of Buddhism. Um, there is from you know. So obviously, this book we're reading is like the original teachings of the Buddha, and this is in India, and. Then Buddhism went to many places in the world. And when it went to um, China and when it went to Burma and Thailand, it just changed with the local culture and became something new. And this is um, also true in Tibet. And in Tibet, there's like just this huge mountains preventing a lot of coming and going. And so in some ways, there's like a, a really different flavor um, in Tibetan Buddhism with a whole variety of schools within it. And a lot of those really intermingle with the indigenous practices of Tibet um, and the Bon tradition there. And yeah, there's a, a lot more to say, but I'll, the Wiki, Wikipedia can tell you a lot. <laughs> and I'm happy to also share, but I think for the purposes of tonight, and there is, devotion is kind of a big part in, in Vajrayana practice specifically. Um, so, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, again, I was mentioning the bhakti practice, and has anyone in this room ever done kirtan, kind of chanting, singing? So that, you know, that's also a devotional practice of bringing these hymns to the goddesses. And this is based in Hindu religion, bring you closer to your feeling of God. Um, and what I'm going to ask us to chant together is Omani Padme Hum. It's got to be the most popular mantra in the world, right? You guys all have heard of it, right? But actually knowing what it means is really special. It's like such a beautiful, I mean, it sounds nice, right? And especially Om and then Hum are considered these seed syllables that in and of themselves, just saying them brings forth different spiritual qualities. 
but Omane Padme whom and saying that, and I wore tonight some of my favorite um, malas. This is a Labradite mala, and this one is very humble mala, but just from right outside the palace of the Dalai Lama. And you'll see people walking, you know, and they are with their hands counting, Omane Padme whom Omane Padme whom Omane Padme I mean, hundreds of thousands of times. And that practice is thought to, it really is thought to purify the mind, heart, and body. Purify the mind, heart, and body. And partially, I think that happens because when you're, you know, repeating that, you're not thinking about all the crazy shit you think about, right? You're not ruminating about the past. You're not projecting onto the future. You're protecting your mind intentionally with prayer. It's very beautiful. Like just that. So beautiful. And it sometimes is called a mind protector. And I think the other week uh, this came up, but when things are really hard, like when last week when my, my beloved cat was missing, I did do a lot of Omane Padme Hum just to avoid the ruminative worries about where she was and what would happen. And um, so you can kind of use it and apply it. Now, what's really interesting is saying it silently in our own head is one thing saying it out loud and then actually chanting it is is even different so with chanting you know this was probably not known in these specific of terms when chanting was really becoming popular um you know they would chant in as we've heard in this book anytime the buddha would give a sutta that was very meaningful they would repeat it and then they would chant it kind of getting that whole memorization together but chanting also really helps activate the vagus nerve, which some of you might have heard about. And it essentially is like this mind-body super highway, this way in which we can feel a sense of um, deep calming. And it's so many things activate the vagus nerve. It's not really like, oh, it's only chanting and this amazing thing. But this one researcher um, and theorist, Stephen Porges, really likes to talk about chanting, sweat lodge, and prostration. Like a lot of these spiritual practices that, you know, they're done for a variety of purposes. But what they do is help us live more easeful in the body, right? And it's very interesting to think about that. It's like, you know, the vagus nerve has associations not only with our internal organs, but even what we're hearing, the dilation of our eyes. Like there's so much that's going on. And when we have that sense of ease that chanting can bring, again, meditation can become more possible. So, Omane Padme Hum. Om, which actually, as some of you may know, is like A-U-M. Um, so not just om, um, and om in Omani Padme Hum is really, it represents both an impure body, speech, and mind, and the pure and exalted body, speech, and mind, recognizing what we are working with and what we can become at once. So that's the om. And then Mani, this is really describing like, well, how do we do this? We need a method. And the method is, is um, you know, our ability to kind of keep practicing and transforming our mind, heart, and body. And we do that especially with our altruistic intention to become enlightened. So our desire to wake up for the sake of all beings, like that's our most skillful method whether we're practicing focused attention on the breath or spacious awareness, it's that intention, that bodhicitta, that is like the most important method. And it's called a jewel. And there's a, I was, I was reading a couple different, and I will tell you so many different interpretations of Omani Padme Hum, which is really beautiful too. Uh, they're all vaguely the same, but this one from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and, and he says this jewel, right? This method, it is, it's so precious. It's like a jewel that you can offer and alleviate all poverty and this jewel that can fulfill all wishes. So we're transforming our own mind into a wish fulfilling jewel. And that sounds good. <laughs> and then 
Um, and then the Padme is our wisdom. So the Mane is the method, and the Padme is the wisdom, and the wisdom of realizing impermanence, emptiness. So really seeing that clearly. So bodhicitta, awareness of impermanence and emptiness. And this is the lotus, right? This is coming out through the mud of our daily life. We really start to see more clearly. And that's what allows us in some ways like that mud and that kind of fermentation of our house getting broken into losing things we love like that's actually the fuel for our understanding uh, so that's the padme and then the whom is the manifestation it's wisdom and method together and whom like just the sound of it it has this kind of uh, unfluctuating, immovable quality. So it's really kind of like, mm. so Aumane Padme Hum. And the way that His Holiness the Dalai Lama describes, you know, how we understand it all together is that this recognizing that this practice of a path is the indivisible union of method and wisdom. And you can transform any unskillful aspects of body, speech, and mind into the mind of a Buddha. So the Omani Padme Hum, it's really chanting that we wake up into our own Buddha nature, into the goodness of what we are. So that's, that's the chant and this idea that each and every one of us has this seed of purity and the chant brings it forth. That's Omane Padme Hum. There's a tune, it, it's chanted in many different ways. Um, we'll chant together for about five minutes and then we'll sit just kind of in the energy of what that chant creates. Um, the tune that I like is one that is uh, traditionally chanted in Tibet in certain monasteries, but there's very there's many many different chants that um, and tunes to these chants. So I'll sing it once, and then we can try it together. And friends online, sing your hearts out, but don't unmute, unfortunately, because the delay makes it impossible with Zoom, um, and it would be horrible. But sing as loud as your neighbor or whoever next to you can tolerate. So. And it's absolutely okay to sit in whatever feels right. It is nice to have an upright spine just so we kind of feel the dignity and integrity of, of chanting and what this chant is offering. I generally chant with my eyes closed, but whatever feels comfortable for you. And again, no need to be pitch perfect in this room. Just beautiful to all, you know, hear one another's voices. I'll sing it once, and then I'll ask you all to join in. The tune, it takes a minute or two, but it's, it is quite simple. Om Mani Padme Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mane Padme Hum Hom Mane Padme Oh Mane Padme Hum Hom Mane Padme Hum Hom Mane Padme Hum Hom Mane Padme Oh Mane Padme Hum Oh, Mani Padme Hum. 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 Oh, Mane Padme, 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 oh, Mane Padme
Mane Padme Hum. Oh, 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 Mane Padme Hum. Just simply sit, feeling the aliveness of this chant in us and together. Sitting, knowing that we have that seed, our own Buddha nature, so alive within us. Sit, knowing that 
all of us have that seed within us. And reflecting once more on the elegance and beauty of this simple mantra. Oh, the possibility of our fully awakened body, speech, and mind. Even here, with the reality of our unawakened body, speech, and mind. Mani, our heart's dedication to awaken for the sake of all beings, that we may be a bridge for those who need landfall, a lamp for those who need light, a bed to rest in for those who are weary, and for those who are suffering, that we could be both medicine and doctor. Padme. Deeply seeing and knowing the impermanence of each and every thing, each and every being, each and every thought and feeling.
whom made manifest. Sitting in our wisdom, our skillful means. And placing hands together at the heart, and dedicating this practice and all of its energy towards the realization of being of greater and greater benefit to all beings. And all beings could be healthy and strong. And all beings could be relieved of suffering. And all beings could know their true nature. Oh, it's so special. Thank you for singing together. Very beautiful. I feel like we just created a brand new experience of the Dharma Collective here. We generated some wonderful energy. Um, I'm going to be teaching here on Saturday. A little half day. If folks want to join. We're going to be moving practice, heart practices, spacious awareness, kind of going between the two.